So welcome to the next exciting instalment of uh, the Issues and Debates, your guided note-taking uh, homework that has been set for you. This one's going to be looking at holism and reductionism, um, which is moving you very much, we're kind of, we've broken the back of it now and we're moving, we have less debates to do than we have done, so well done, that's really good. Hopefully it'll be finished just before or just after Easter, um, so we can move on to revision. As you can see here then, as, um, we've looked at gender and cultural bias, free will versus determinism and nature versus nurture, and now we're on to holism and reductionism. And the key things that you could be asked about specifically in the exam question, so the exact wording would be levels of explanation, biological reductionism and environmental reductionism as well. I think later on I'll briefly, very, very briefly touch on experimental reductionism because that's quite an interesting concept too, but it isn't key. You don't have to know about it for um, the exam, as in it won't specifically ask for it, but it's a really useful one that makes your life that bit easier. So levels of explanation and biological reductionism and environmental reductionism. And as always, you need to know AO1 and AO3. So you need to be able to tell me about each one of those things. You need to be able to give me examples of each one and you need to be able to evaluate. OK, and then this is an example of a few of the questions and I've got a mark scheme I'll put up on uh, YouTube soon as well. So briefly outline what psychologists mean by levels of explanation, dead simple one for two marks. Outline and evaluate reductionist explanations in psychology. So in that one you'd have to explain what reductionism is, you'd have to exp um, give some examples of reductionist explanations of psych in psychology and then you'd have to evaluate those explanations. And then the best way to understand and explain behaviour is to reduce it to um, it to the simplest component parts and then you and then you have a 16 marker in the context of the holism reduction debate discuss this view and refer to at least one other topic what I would say automatically the way that we're teaching you and the way we're looking at it is that every single example that we use uh, so every key term we come across there'll be examples that go with it so you can talk about that and that statement there the best way to understand and explain behavior is to reduce it to its simplest component parts is the basic concept of reductionism now a word of warning when i marked unit three for the old paper last year which is probably this, um there was a certain examiner on there a s senior examiner my guess would be he would be a similar examiner to this year um, possibly, potentially, and he was extremely strict on reductionism. So I used to avoid teaching it because it wasn't a requirement of the spec. I used to encourage students to avoid it, uh, and I would still continue to suggest that you do that in other essays. Obviously, you can't avoid it to get all together because it's on the spec, but um, because of quite how students understand it. So it's really key not to just think about it focuses on one thing and ignores all other explanations. It's not quite as simple as that. We need more complex sort of consideration of it. So with this is absolutely key topic that there could be some potential issues for that it's really, really important that you're confident with. It's a real kind of uh, danger zone within the specification. Okay. So, AO1, holism and reductionism. Reductionism is the breaking down of complex ideas into simple components, um, and all phenomena should be explained using the most basic principles. So this concept of something called Ockram's razor, which you've probably referred to, it's the idea that you have multiple, um, if you have multiple hypotheses for various different things, the best place to start is with the simplest hypothesis. That is not necessarily kind of um, the best way to select a, a result or an an the correct, the, the most accurate hypothesis. But what it does allow us to do, if we pick the most simple one, then we can apply the concept of falsifiability, which you're all aware of, of course, the fact that nothing can ever be proved, things can only be disproved. So if you pick a really, really simple hypothesis, hopefully, if it can be disproved, um, it will be quite it's simply and quite quickly. And then you need to move up to uh, um, the levels of explanations as they become more com complex. But the basic idea is that all phenomena should be explained using the most pr basic principles. And there's also something called parsimony, which is exactly the same idea. But it's all about simple. So three different key terms, but basically the similar concept. I would highly encourage you to have a look at Ockram's Razor, um, just on Wikipedia or quick YouTube. There's some really interesting information about it. It's quite a simple concept, but it's a useful one to accurately explain because uh, it's very easy to oversimplify this. And then we have different levels of explanation within the concept of reductionism. So even within reductionism itself, we start with the lowest, most 
um, kind of simple basic principle and move up to the, high, the highest more complex one and there you can see the lowest level is biological explanation, the middle is psychological explanations and the highest is cultural and social explanations um, and the examples of things you could talk about are OCD or memory and the key and they're in the cat book um, or the green haired girl book both of which you have access to of course sorry the dog book not the cat book because it's A2 so please look in your books but also look at my scan sheets that I've sent you if you're struggling to access them for the pink haired girl please let me know I select the most important and the most useful information from both don't rely on just one or the other make sure you've got access to both of them and of course if you're not a fan a huge fan of the, the videos this isn't working for you that's absolutely fine I don't mind how you access the information all that is absolutely essential is that you do access that information as you know by now going into classes we don't go over it in lots and lots of detail so if you don't use this opportunity to make sure you have notes that help you understand the topic then you will struggle to access the two hours you'll struggle to achieve well in the exam so please make sure if you're using the time to make any notes at all make sure they are useful and they make sense to you because um, otherwise you'll get, get behind and get lost in lessons and you will struggle in the exam which hopefully none of you will you'll all be you'll all do excellently well in the exam as long as you put in the effort so returning to the uh, the levels of a reductionism you have the lowest level biological middle psychological and highest cultural and social explanations lots of different ways you can look at so i would encourage you to have a different think about all the variety of different explanations uh, but here there's something i've stolen from the tutor a screenshot i've stolen from the tutor to you website which should be um, a way of demonstrating it. So the most simple um, explanation, they've kind of filtered it down from the top to the bottom, but you could look at it the other way. So the most simple explanation is the idea of um, considering memory in biological components. And of course, I don't know a great deal about that because uh, memory was a topic that you looked at with Andy. But um, there's Maguire et al, who was somebody who conducted research. And this is where we link in with brain, brain plasticity again. So if I were you, I'd go and do some research, re refresh and research some knowledge on that. Uh, so Maguire looked at brain plasticity and he found that taxi drivers, um, the size of the hippocampus was much, much larger in taxi drivers because of, their, uh, because of their increased need for memory and spatial navigation because they need to do something called the knowledge, which is a test that all taxi drivers in London have to take before they can be taxi drivers. Um, so that would be the most basic idea, the fact that the memory is linked to the hippocampus within the brain. Then if we're kind of expanding that higher up, um, you could also talk about it from a psychological level. And of course, you've got uh, capacity and duration, Peterson and Peterson. So there's no actual physical model. There's no physical kind of bit of the brain, or there could be linked to it as well. But the basic, with psychological, there's no physical like part of the brain which uh, controls memory. We just explore the, the kind of the structure of memory itself, so it's capacity, capacity and duration, and then social and cultural. So it's kind of expanding upwards. So hopefully you'd start off with you'd reduce it down to the most simple, and then gradually as you kind of disprove those, you'd have to move up to the more complex ones. But you want to remain at the lower end of um, the reductionism hypo um, sort of spectrum. And then of course um, there's I don't know if you looked up with Andy uh, schema theory and Bartlett and the idea that certain co we recall more information. Uh, related to kind of cultural expectations. So my advice would be to go and research those, kind of make some notes on those and think about that. Can you apply it to any other year one topics or year two topics? Aggression is also a key one as well. Okay, and then biological reductionism, so neurochemistry, neurophysiology uh, and evolutionary um, approach, genetics, all of that stuff. So you can tell me all about those already. So you can already tell me about neurochemistry, you can tell me about depression and serotonin, you can tell me about OCD and serotonin and dopamine. You can tell me about schizophrenia and dopamine, neurophysiology, uh, um, neurobrain and the physiology, obviously the physical elements of it as well. So you can tell me about, about the structure. You know about all of those things already because we looked at them in biology. So if you could return to look at localization, lateralization, tell me what different parts of the brain control which different parts of behavior. That's really vital. I know it's really tempting to avoid biopsychology, move away from it because you don't like it. I totally understand that can't emphasize in how much it is important that you do refresh your knowledge of all of those things constantly and are comfortable with biopsychology because there is an entire t section on paper one that um, you need to be aware of so paper two at um, a2 that you need to be aware of biopsychology of course evolution you can talk about bus you can talk about um, younger women and older men uh, more uh, sort of financially wealthy men or, or well-resourced men for women go for for evolution and why is that and why does everybody want kind and intelligence mates it's all about 
ensuring survival and then the passing on the genetics. And then you've got your genetics, so you can also talk about genes when we looked at them with OCD. So please return back to the biological approach to refresh your knowledge of the biological explanation of OCD. Um, and also have a look at the biopsychology as well. The more that you know in detail, the easier, the less you will have to remember for individual topics. So I'm trying wherever I can to overlap things. Environmental reductionism again is so the idea that it's all due to stimulus and response. So the, the most basic kind of explanation for human behaviour is that we experience the stimulus within the environment and then we respond to it. Uh, and then of course is the behaviourist approach. So they, do, they don't study the little black box, they don't study um, what cogn um, cognitive psychologists do, they just want to see if a stimulus is presented, do we respond to it? And there's loads of examples you could use there. Pavlov, you could talk about uh, phobias, is attachment, which is mentioned down there, all of those things. So again, use this as an opportunity to go back and research that so your life is much, much easier because I will be asking people to write essays. haven't quite decided exactly how yet, but I'm toying with the idea of your writing your own individual essay for um, in lesson next week and then marking them all Friday if you're my Friday class. And then we've got holism, so gestalt psychology, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So holism doesn't think that it's useful to pick everything apart. Everything works in sort of a delicate balance. Everything is combined together and interacts together. And so it says that any attempt to break up behavior um, is um, ineffective. So it's not helpful for just to consider uh, biopsychology in one element um, culture is something separate, for psychological explanations are something separate. They need to all be combined so we can understand and appreciate everything fully. Um, and we're going to talk about some examples of that, like the diathesis stress model in the evaluation points as well. And of course, humanism can un tries to understand human behaviour and viewing humans as a whole, so holistic or heuristic. And also the cognitive approach as well does attempt to do that occasionally. Um, but it would be really useful for that one for you to look back on your notes and have some examples. The more examples you can have to illustrate your point, the better. And then holism is the reductionism, so the strengths and the weaknesses of it. Um, as always, the one of the first points that you can talk about, so if you're ever stuck for any of the debates and um, you can't think of an answer, then you can talk about the negative impact of whatever insert uh, issue or debate that you're discussing. And this one is for um, reductionism. So the idea of reductionism is that we can... By reducing things down, we can miss um, a more complete picture. There's le we, we, we struggle to appreciate um, fully the behaviour. For example, you've got Wolpe in 1973 who conducted some systematic desensitisation. So again, something would be really important for you to go away and to revise, especially because hopefully we'll be looking at it in session this week as well. You'll be having a go at some of the AS stuff. Um, so more of a coots, which is exciting for you. And then systematic desensitisation. So of course, uh, counter conditioning and... Um, the idea that it, instead of condition, being conditioned to experience anxiety and fear when you experience a, um, a fear stimulus, instead that you should, uh, that we um, recondition you, counter condition you to experience um, a relaxation. So you can, you can condition, you're conditioned to think, see a stimulus and think relaxation. So previously you'd see a spider and you'd be conditioned to freak out. And then gradually as we do the relaxation step by step, going through the fear hierarchy, then instead um, you are conditioned to see a spider and think, ah, relaxation, of course. So please refresh your knowledge of that one. Remember that one. And then we've got here with Walt with the example of the insect. So he uh, found that systematic desensitization was ineffective when he was trying to support some, a woman with a severe insect um, phobia. And then because they'd reduced it down to the basic environmental kind of reductionism concept, the idea that she sees a stimulus, the insect, and responds with a fear response, they missed out the fact that actually the reason she was displaying that was because her husband um, and had a nickname that was linked to something to do with insects and um, she was finding their marriage really difficult at that moment in time so by putting some marriage counseling some marriage counseling in place that eventually was the thing that effectively removed um, or reduced her phobia so by using re reductionism we're ignoring um, other potential kind of factors that combined together might explain a behavior suggesting that holism is a more effective approach I would also encourage you to include a second example within that so this is the kind of the the either sides of it the jam in the middle the big chunk of the examples is where you show all of your knowledge off and then the two points either side the top the top and tail or the peak the point in the um explain or whatever you might want to call it 
um, are probably limited in how much they can get you because they're difficult to explore. So I'd encourage you to have that do give two examples to really bulk that out. And then of course the idea that reductionism distracts, so the walk one and then this example which would be that it distracts from a more appropriate um, kind of level. So the idea that even within reductionism itself, if the focus is on the lowest, um, the most simple explanation, so biological, for example depression or OCD, the idea would be that certain elements of neurochemistry cause problems which would provide them with um, prescription antidepressant drugs, things like that, which do of course alleviate some people symptoms it some um, it doesn't cure the uh, the problem the um, the condition altogether and it certainly doesn't uh, provide relief for symptoms from everybody so maybe we need to consider there might be more appropriate reasons to consider so are they social reasons or psychological reasons as well so of course is there something happening with their environment so if someone goes in and says they feel depressed and we pump them full of drugs well it could be because they're experiencing grief at that point in time which would be a psychological um, um, explanation and um, they would be asked to um, and that they'd be asked to take part in counselling, which wouldn't be as effect, which would be more effective than just giving them drugs. Or if we kind of think even further, so a cultural or a social reason, we could talk about the idea at the moment that lots of people are experiencing depression because um, of the economy currently um, and the difficulties around that as well. So you could discuss that. So it's more than just um, reductionism can sort of distract from by being too reductionist, can distract and move away from other ideas. Um, suggesting holism might be more appropriate because it allows us to more accurately and therefore more validly explain uh, behaviours. Then biological reductionism, exactly the same thing. Um, so, sorry, not exactly the same thing, the opposite. So this is a good thing about biological reductionism. So we talk about drug treatment. So if, um, we, bla if we identify biological reason for a mental health condition or whatever, an abnormal behaviour, um, then we can provide drug treatments which do not attribute blame, which is very, very useful. So you could talk about, and I'd kind of think of an example of that. Why is that useful? Because thinking about the person's feelings, um, and also sort of um, allowing them to move forward. and that, But then also um, you could talk about drugs and why they're a problem. So this is a really nice, easy one to balance. So biological reductionism allows us to develop real-world applications such as drug treatments, which are really positive because they don't attribute blame, but then also they do cause side effects. And of course, they only focus on the symptoms. So the idea that if once a person stops taking the drug, uh, the symptoms will return. Um, so a much more extended point than that with lots of different terms like validity, linking it back to the idea of holism and reductionism, but that's a nice extended one you can do. And um, environmental reductionism, and of course that's mostly based on things like the behaviourist approach, and as we know that's based on non-human and animal research, so you can talk all about extrapolation, lack of validity, and also the idea really significantly that um, non-human and animal research ignores social and cognitive concepts, so we, we'd have very different cognition from animals um, animal participants and also our social environment isn't the same so we could possibly argue that animals still have some kind of social uh, networks that probably is the case and if you could think of any examples you could include that would be excellent but um, they don't have quite the same s complex social uh, network and social experience that we have so that's a problem as well and then finally the interactionist approach which you can use in two ways you could say it's a strength so by acknowledging um, holism versus reductionism it's something that we need to consider or you could um, talk about draw, use it more as a conclusion point so nowadays um, interactionist approach is the one that is the most um, encouraged and that looks at a mixture of different levels of reductionism so kind of moving more towards holism because of course reductionism is really and you could talk about this in your evaluation point as well reductionism is positive because it allows us to identify and pinpoint one thing and therefore try to attempt to either to disprove it and if we don't if we don't and obviously um, we can be more confident in its validity so you're talking about falsifiability in the features of science whereas of course holism in, on its own isn't that appropriate because it doesn't help us develop general laws um, and if you think about humanism it's it's sort of an interesting study into human behavior but it doesn't really tell us a great deal it's not particularly useful but if we look at things as a mixture so acknowledge that the reduct we need to look at things more holistically but still remain within reductionism to have a mixture of different levels and we could talk about it so the diathesis diathesis stress model uh, which is like the drip effect so when we talk about it within schizophrenia but it could be applied to absolutely anything so if you imagine somebody is born and their um, their ability to cope with stress or their likelihood their vulnerability to schizophrenia is like a bucket if you're born with a genetic propensity then your bucket is already half full of water and then as things happen in your life um, you get drip it drips and starts to fill up your bucket more with stress so for example if there's a grievance uh, if there's um, a, um, a death a bereavement 
moment in the family if the um, parents get divorced, if they experience some kind of traumatic event, some kind of abuse, then that all fills up their bucket and eventually overflows, which is the um, the metaphor for experiencing schizophrenia. Whereas um, the other idea would be, so if they didn't have a genetic propensity, it would explain why somebody else who didn't have a genetic propensity could um, experience all the same things as somebody else, uh, but not become schizophrenic because um, their bucket's only half full because the poor schizophrenic that was genetic had a genetic propensity already their bucket was already partly full so when it filled up it overflowed whereas the same amount in life wouldn't do that um, as well although it still explains why if there's still enough stress the person even without a genetic propensity can um, experience that so that would be a mixture of biological um, and sort of social um, or environmental uh, behaviours as well. You could talk about anything like that. And of course, as you all know, if you explore, if you consider both points of view, um, or consider the more points of view you consider, the more increased the validity is, because the more likely the study is to be, um, sorry, the theory is to be accurate. So don't forget to link it back to holism and reductionism. There you go. That's uh, notes on the interactionist approach. So if you need to pause to have a look at those, you can do. There are some tasks that I'd really seriously suggest and consider that you take part in. Um, to think about doing and then some really basic um, additional reading with tutor to you notes as well any questions please please do get in touch if you're arriving to class thinking i'm really not sure of this information then um, you need to get in touch with me beforehand to let me know so i can support you with it and i'd be really keen to think that people weren't completing the notes just to uh, just like the, the um, session before my lesson which i've kind of spotted a couple of times in the green area um and certainly not copying the notes from anybody either, which I'm sure most, uh, almost none of you do, hopefully. Uh, so please come to class with those notes really clear. If you're not sure of something, contact me. Have another listen to the video, have a read of the books, have a quick look on the internet. But if you really aren't sure, you really do need to contact me before session so we can go through it, we can explain it, and then you can engage fully with the other activities. Okay, thank you.